it's David, and you're listening to the Tone Bass Classical Guitar Podcast. If you're wondering uh, if we're still releasing an episode next Sunday, which happens to be on Christmas Eve, uh, as my favorite band would say, Pink Floyd, the show must go on. Uh, we'll be featuring Elliot Fisk in that episode, and I'll also be announcing some of the guests we have for season two. I think you'll be very excited for some of these guitarists. Today, I've got a conversation with Richard Savino. He's an early music specialist, uh, playing many different instruments, uh, broke guitars, thurobos, lutes. And uh, what I find particularly interesting about Richard is he's not only a scholar of Renaissance and Baroque music, he's also very engaged in uh, the classical music of the 19th century, playing on period instruments um, from that time period as well. I find a lot of times with early music specialists, they tend to stick around in the Renaissance and Baroque eras and don't explore quite as much. And I think it's really unique with Richard. So let's go ahead and jump right into things uh, before our interview. This is a really fun Spanish dance uh, by the composer Marchia titled Villanos. <laughs> give a little background i sent an email to uh savino's old email and he just saw it about an hour before we set up these mics and i we just gave a call it's like yeah let's meet together so thank you for being flexible i'm so glad uh we caught each other when i'm still here in san francisco no we had that hour and a half window and i said let's do it let's go for it sometimes uh the the best musical collaborations not saying we're going to go on and record uh the next uh under pressure uh you track. Mean this isn't going to be a grateful dead jam session or you never know you know i mean i see lots of instruments here but sometimes the best things are just super um last minute spontaneous i mean un- under pressure queen and david bowie they just happened to be in the same studio one night and they were like hey let's jam so they started jamming at midnight and then they wrote the song under pressure and recorded it by six in the morning and it turned into an absolute classic i love that you are beginning my interview with a quote about David Bowie and Queen. <laughs> <laughs> well, this uh, pun very much intended. You are a man of Renaissance. Many people know you um, with your early music work, but it, it's very interesting to me that you're a uh, very accomplished and active uh, tradi- or s- a traditional contemporary guitars as well. And you have lots of different interests um, and different genres of music. I know the Beatles are some of your total idols. I, I don't even know where to start with you. There's so much to talk about. <laughs> well, I mean, this is this is the byproduct of ADD and hyperactivity as a youth. And thankfully, entering into my early 60s, it's of great benefit to me at this moment. So um, I just finished completing a uh, recording with my group, El Mundo. Um, we're a Grammy-nominated group, and we've been touring the U.S. and have had concerts in Europe. Um, we haven't done the Far East yet. And that's on the agenda. But we do music from Spain, Latin America, and Italy from the 17th through early 19th centuries on period instruments. Very nice. And it's quite a flexible instrumentation. It can be as small a group as four people. It can be a lar- as large a group on some of our recordings as 20. 
So we just completed a project of music from the Guatemala City Cathedral that is stunning and really mixes the um, traditions of a folkloric Latin American culture with high Baroque music from Spain from the early 18th century. It's gorgeous stuff. Um, in addition, the other big project that has consumed me for the past year is I got a call out of the blue from a gentleman who has the largest collection of privately owned Rembrandts in the world. The only private Vermeer paintings by Jan Stein, um, Kravanger, Dutch masters, t dozens and dozens of these paintings. And he was putting together an online catalog to accompany a touring part of the collection to the Louvre, Shanghai, Abu Dhabi, numerous other big museums um, throughout the world. And he wanted this online catalog to have soundtracks when he discusses each of the paintings. Wow. And I did 25 of these, some of which I recorded in the middle of the night in my bedroom, and some <laughs> of which were taken from tracks that I had that I have the rights to. Yeah. Uh, the um, Actually, if anybody's interested, go to the LeidenCollection.com and then pull do the pull-down menu to videos. Okay. L-E-I-D-E-N, LeidenCollection.com. And um, how did you go about picking the pieces to choose with each painting did he send you uh photos of these paintings or did he kind of have an idea i want this piece or was this part of the the whole uh th this is a million dollar question i guess it was it was a fascinating thing i've done a lot of work with artists i've designed programs and had, have had cds issued one of our one of el mundo's other cds of recent note is what artemisia heard based on the life of artemisia gentileschi a um, contemporary of caravaggio so for this project, though, with the Leiden collection, I would get a script of what the narrative was that would be spoken. Okay. I would get a copy of the painting, and then I would get snippets of the video. And finally, I just said, just send me the finished video. Because what you have to do is you have to match the piece of music to the pacing of the narrative, to the aesthetic of the painting, and you if there are juxtapositions and cuts, you really have to have the music accompany those, too. Yeah. Um, and I, it was all my choice. And I chose, he wanted, or I should say they wanted music of the epoch that would be reflective of the aesthetics of those paintings. The craziest thing about this project is I got the call to do the project initially um, a year and a half ago in December. And they said, I, I assumed it would be like an eight, nine month project. Mm -hmm. They wanted it done in a month and a half. Not only that, I was going in for some minor surgery and I didn't even know if I could hold an instrument for a few weeks. Just, it was a minor surgical procedure, but it was one of those things where I took time off. Turned out like two days after my surgery, I could hold the instrument. I set up my little recording set studio and I rec was recording in the middle of the night. <laughs> <laughs> that is crazy. <laughs> it was insane. That, that is, uh, that's quite a, a time crunch, but it sounds like it, it it came together beautifully, it all did, together. It did, and in fact, they have since contacted me a number of times for additional soundtracks, for additional Fantastic. videos. Fantastic. Yeah. And um, I haven't talked about it on this platform, but I did a project one time, a much lower um, scale compared to what you did here, where I had to collaborate with uh, a sculptor, a graphic designer, and myself. And we basically created this performance, you know, uh, projecting that was mapped onto the this beautiful little kind of simple simplistic uh i i'm not very good at describing art but but a uh, sculpture done and i i played a piece to it and it kind of created this big performance it's really reminded me so much thinking about that with uh, your project and there's something amazing bringing together different facets and worlds of art as oh, once it's all connected into the integration of art in a variety of, genre, of um, mediums is to me one of the most interesting things of all. Yeah. Be it visual, oral, A-U-R-A-L, dance. It's it's fantastic. I also then like to imbue it with some of the socio-political issues that are that surround it. Like one of the programs I love doing is this program based on the life of Francisco Goya because the man lived through approximately f four different artistic epochs. He ends up being a sort of a presage to the expressionist art movement that would take place in the early 20th century with his black paintings um, and the musical trends. You know, he's born in the middle of the Baroque period. He goes through the classical period. By the time he dies, we are well into the Romantic period. Wow. It's quite a fascinating life. That's uh, 
quite a span to live in, to say the least. And my goodness. And don't forget the issues relate, relating to this, like the Napoleonic invasion of Spain, yeah. which decimated Spanish life. And um, you know, not to make this a political show at all, but there today, even in the classical world, I mean, it's totally common to see you know rock and pop and rap albums, you know, um, making stances uh, with political organizations, groups, governments, however you look at it. Uh, but in the classical world, I'm seeing quite a few pieces emerging right now that are definitely um, protests to the uh, the circus that's going on right now. Well, one only need to listen to the Threnody for the victims of Hiroshima by Penderecki. And, you know, right there is a, a piece of classical protest music. But look, in the 1950s, you had Woody Guthrie. And, you know, if you sang This Land is Your Land, This Land is My Land, you were... Um, assaulted by McCarthyites for being a communist. Yeah, it, um, a lot of people find that song to be a very happy-sounding song, but when you listen to the lyrics and you look into it, it's a pretty strong protest altogether. And it's uh, music is a great way of expressing just total disgust at what's happening in this world, whether it's from politics, war, violence. And... Um, I don't want to say it's a solution or anything, but it's definitely a great way to express feelings that are hard to put into words. Well, I mean, in particular, the folk movement I was mentioning before with Woody Guthrie did that to a great extent. You know, Bob Dylan's early period. Um, come gather around children wherever you roam and admit that the waters around you have grown. You know, it's it, it's just fantastic Yeah, um, music to accompany those kinds of social endeavors. But it's not unique only to the folk music. Obviously, the rock world in the 1960s got very involved in it. Very much. You know, so. It's, uh. It's, and Stockhausen was very, very, very political. Let's also not forget him. Yeah. And I think in a world that's just so polarized right now with this circus I'm mentioning, people get so angry so easily, uh, more than ever in regards to politics, at least from my experience. And, um... You know, I think in a way, composers in the classical world particularly are a little hesitant to get political, but I think if anything, it should be biggest now. I have many friends who have a very different political philosophy than I do, and mm -hmm. I really do call it a philosophy. I don't call it politics. That kind of tends to demean it, but it's a philosophy of life. Yeah. But frankly, if you sit down with people and you say, let's put all our stuff on the table, all of it, you mostly, frankly, agree on about 85% of your stuff, 85%. Mm -hmm. So on that 15, and maybe it's only 10%, you just, say, you just have to say, let's split it. Because yeah. other, otherwise, we're just going to kill each other. Well, that's um, w what I hate about it so much is just how enraging everyone gets. Yeah, the hostility to, that has imbued it. And, right and just now, now and, and I'm guilty of this. I'd be a hypocrite to say I, I don't judge based off of it. But it, nowadays, it's almost like people just totally right off the bat will judge a person for who they are just based off of do they think this or that? It's just awful. You know, end of the day, I and I mean, look, I, I got my very strong opinions, and I'm sure you've got very oh, strong opinions. I do. And I'm sure <laughs> everyone listening, uh, has very strong opinions and I hope in no way that I'm going to create any tension, you know, uh, including this, but, um, it's, um, at the end of the day, we live a short life. Let's oh, just yeah. enjoy it. Enjoy it. And you have to compromise somewhere. And what's interesting is I have, I put together a group of people that texts almost daily. And some of these members are some of our close friend guitarists national and international. I won't name them all right now, but you've been interviewing a bunch of them. Mm -hmm. And we have amongst ourselves very differing, differing opinions. But I went out of my way to organize this group so that we could have a dialogue about it. And it's, it's remarkable. Um, it's been really fun. Um, David's a member. Um, John Dearman and Elliot Fisk, Ben Verdery. There's a bunch of us. It's like 12 oh, that of sounds. us. <laughs> you, you should turn that into a podcast and, and call it guitar, guitar dialogues, guitar dialogues with nothing about the guitar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things I, I, I found very interesting looking at, at your bio before we met today, you're a huge Beatles fan there. I, I, th I think the Beatles are one of the most significant musical phenomenons of the latter part of the 20th century without question, equitable, 
in many ways to Stravinsky because of their social impact too. But as a musical force, a, a com the combination of those specific individuals for a period of six years, five to six years, evolved in a way that I know of no other comparison. None. And it was only six years. Well, they or, or, they originally got together in 1957, yeah, yeah, yeah. but, you know, they were kids and they were playing skiffle music and they were covering American pop groups. And, you know, frankly, well into their end of their touring period, 65, um, because their last tour was in 66, um, they were they knew the American canon better than any other group. If you listen to any of their live performances from the BBC, their versions of Chuck Berry, their versions of Carl Perkins, um, Little Richard are phenomenal. Um, I had no idea about it, that. I'm going to listen to that right after this. It's spectacular. They played the American canon on BBC radio while they were making Rubber Soul and Revolver. Wow. It, or, you know, preparing to make Revolver, um, which are revolutionary recordings. You know, the conclusion to Revolver is um, John Lennon's Tomorrow Never Knows, taken from the Tibetan Book of the Dead, and certainly influenced by the minimalist movement that was emerging uh, in classical music. Yeah. It's fantastic. And, and harmonically, compositionally speaking, they were brilliant. 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 No, revolutionary. I mean... You can have your opinions on the Beatles, and I know some people aren't the biggest fans, but I do not know a band as revolutionary as you're speaking. This scope of change and their sound all together. I mean, if you listen to earlier stuff and then compare that to more of their transitional period with uh, Magic Mystery... Uh, Magical Mystery Tour and Sgt. And Pepper Sessions. It's crazy. They, they, you know, they were the prototype for punk with songs like Helter Skelter. They did Music Concrete with um, Revolution Number no. 9. They did Tin Pan Alley, that Paul McCartney excelled in. They did incredible big band kinds of charts. You listen to the song, Tell Me Why, and that's like a Count Basie, Cab Calloway um, tune being done by a rock band, uh, which is why they were, What was one of their brilliant moves was they could appeal to such a wide audience base. It wasn't just kids, it was their parents too. Yeah, it's probably... Partly why they were so successful. Leonard and, Bernstein loved him. Yeah. Loved, 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 you know. He, I remember reading uh, the, his quotes about Sgt. Pepper. Remarkable. From your own projects, whether they're concerts or recordings, do you ever try to incorporate their music? Oh, or? I, I do. I, I'll, I'll sometimes do a set of Beatle tunes at the end of it on Baroque guitar, which sounds great for, really? for a number of Beatle tunes. Oh, yeah. that's, wh which songs do you throw oh, on Oh, in it? particular, or, Norwegian Wood or... Um, Cry Baby Cry by John Lennon. Um, you can't do that. Works great. <laughs> it's, you know. So why? How did you night. decide that sounds so great on Baroque guitar? I mean, was it just your? I was just noodling around. It with was it. like, oh, this is this sounds beautiful. Tough. Well, the Beatles used a lot of electric twelve-string guitars, uh -huh. and they have octave stringing on yeah. the, on you know the lowest strings, and the Baroque guitar is basically that without yeah. the sixth string, and it works. And it's such a. I, I love the sound of a Baroque guitar. It's just such a, uh, a soothing, beautiful, but open sound because of these courses and everything. And, and it's a unique sound. It's specifically different from the lute or the modern guitar. I actually just made a major Baroque guitar discovery that I'm not going to completely disclose here just yet. Okay. Because I found it in, a, in an archive of music that it shouldn't have been in. It was mislabeled. It's in Spain. And... It consists of music by not just guitar composers, it's actually all non-guitar composers, but the most important composers of the Spanish Baroque period. Um, Antonio Literes, Juan Hidalgo, Sebastian Duron. And um, I'm going to be writing an article about it. I'm gonna, going to transcribe it, and um, we'll see where it goes. Wow. Yeah. For our listeners, just in case if they aren't totally familiar with your work, how many instruments do you play? I'm I'm looking around here, and I I, I, I would, you have more instruments than I have fingers. Um, yeah, that's you know that's like my um, hoarder instinct. <laughs> but it's a good thing. To, oh, it's a good thing. It's a good Absolutely. Thing. I I it's better than me. I've got ten different coffee makers. That, oh, that's okay. pointless. You know, no, no, I need I, one. For coffee maker. I dedicate myself to one until it dies. It's sort of like my my cars and my friends who are listening to this. If you're listening, will know what I my reference there. <laughs> Um, I regularly play 19th century guitar, um, 
and different kinds of 19th century guitars. Miracore, seven and eight strings. Um, the instruments of Torres, I have a beautiful copy of a Torres FE17 by Michael Thames. And I, I'm very privi- privileged in that I get to play on a lot of the original instruments, too. Um, I play a lot of Baroque guitar. I've done four solo Baroque Baroque guitar recordings, I believe, a whole bunch of 19th century ones, um, Mertz, Paganini, and Giuliani with Monica Huggett, the great British violinist, complete Boccherini quintets on a period X. I play a lot of the Orbo. I love playing the Orbo because you get to run amok. You know, <laughs> you, you get to just improvise, and if, especially if you're doing an opera and the singer ornaments a certain way you can respond. And it's like playing, you know, trading licks in a rock band, which There's is a lot of flexibility. Tons. Well, you're just looking at a bass line and many times that bass line is what I call a goose egg. You know, you, we just, you, you're not just going to play that one note of that one chord. The idea is to reflect the affectation of the text and then create some kind of a dialogue with the singer and reflect their interpretation of what's going on. And that, that's a guess. Playing figured bass is really just an art. And I, I've dabbled in it a bit, but it, it must take years and years to begin to master. It's really quite funny. Everybody thinks you're like some brilliant genius if you play figured bass on a plucked string instrument. And frankly, I, I would like that to continue. I want them to keep thinking that. Because <laughs> <So. laughs> then you make more money. No. Uh. <laughs> oh, yeah. The Bucks are on this, the school of loot for a reason. Oh, L-O-O-T. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, you know... It's the kind of thing, at first, it's intimidating. And the biggest problem is, if you do it the way I do it, you have to keep track of different tunings. So if you're switching instruments, you got to remember that if the orbo's tuned in A, the top two strings are down an octave, and all your bass strings are going to be um, diatonically tuned down from that A. If you jump over to an arch lute, your top two strings are at the high pitch like a Renaissance lute, but now you're in G, so it's a tone off from the other instrument. And the third on those instruments is between the third and fourth string, not between the second and third string. So then if you grab a guitar, the third is between the second and third string, and the highest pitch string is not a G, it's not an A, now it's an E. They're that's, all over the place. That's the hard one. And, you know, as I enter into the twilight of my life, rather than doing Sudoku puzzles or something like that, I'm just going to keep playing continuo on different instruments because it really keeps your brain in order. Um, you have to be focused in a way that's unlike anything else. Um, because on one instrument, one fingering is an E chord, it's a G chord another, it's an A chord and another. It's crazy. It's a little insane. When did you get involved with early music? Uh, did you start playing these instruments at a young age, or did you discover no. this passion later? Later. Um, and I'm a few years younger than the crop of brilliant players that I love. My my close friends, Paul, Paul, Nigel North, Paul O'Dead, uh, Hopkins and Smith, Jacob Lindbergh, Paul Beyer. They're all like a couple years older than me. Okay. Um, and I really did this straight and narrow guitar path for a while, you know, starting with rock and roll. I convinced myself I was a d- decent jazz fusion fusion player when I really sucked, but I, I faked it. And people believed me because I faked it convincingly. Um, and I actually had a little renown in New York um, doing that kind of stuff for a while. Um, then I went strictly classical guitar, and I was very privileged to have, you know, just had great mentors and teachers. Jerry Willard was one of was my main teacher, and he was just so patient with me and gave me a very long leash. Then I met Oscar Gillia and Elliot Fisk. And even though Elliot's only a couple years older than me, Elliot is this brilliant man, magnificently uh, equipped to communicate art, philosophy, music to you. Um, and then suddenly I found myself in these Segovia classes with a bunch of my other colleagues, like David Tannenbaum, who you spoke with earlier today. Mm-hmm. In fact, that's where I met David. We were, we were picked for the sort of select class Adam Holtzman was in that one too. Steve Robinson, I can't Michael Locke, I think. Uh, Quite a lineup. Yeah, it was like five of us. It was the Metropolitan Museum of Art hmm. in New York, 1982. It was the evening class in the Spanish courtyard, filmed by PBS. It was high pressure. I was not. I was like, whoa, this is. Dan. <laughs> I'd be pretty freaked out oh, myself. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, it, that was just a great experience. Um, you know, the whole Segovia thing. It was like meeting Buddha, that kind of thing. It was like meeting a high priest yeah. for me. Um, and David and I met 
right before we, we went to the men's room and I'm standing at the urinal, we're both trying to just get ourselves ready for this. And, you know, obviously you're taking a leak because you're nervous. <laughs> and that's where they, we were both New Yorkers and we're the same age and we met taking a leak right before the Segovia class. Who would have thought, uh, <laughs> however many years later, you'd be colleagues at the San Francisco Conservatory. Yeah, and really good close friends. <laughs> it was funny as heck. I guess um, it didn't piss you off too much. <laughs> oh, that was a good one. Sorry. That was as good. I said, it's been that too was, much time no, with that, Bill. It's I been liked, too much that time. That was good. <laughs> and then from there, I don't know why, Segovia took a shine to me, and I studied with him in Europe for a summer at the uh, Conservatory of, at the Conservatoire du Musique in Geneva. And so I was doing the mainstream classical guitar thing um and i had a couple of private lessons with him in new york hmm. which was really fascinating to just sit and he's in his bathrobe and i'm playing the sore grand solo for him at, at around that time you know my teacher jerry willard played lute and i i loved i just loved it and i finally just said i'm i've got to at least get one of these things and figure figure it out but i didn't want to give up playing modern guitar and you know at this point in time there was this new orthodoxy that everybody had to cut their nails off and you had to only play thumb under which now what we know and you know it's taken a while for this to happen in italy and in spain they played with nails it's really? well documented yeah i can show you wow. i can show you this beautiful engraving of domenico pellegrini from 1650 he's waving his hand in front right hand in front of you he has very long nails alessandro piccinini 16 um, 23 1639 in his method talks about playing con sommità del uno with only the tip of the nail to produce a sil uh, a sound uh, that's a molto argentina very silvery metallic like well, you know just with the tip of the nail hmm. um a number of the um spanish methods um, talk about playing with nails. Fernando Ferrandieri, Federico Moretti, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so it seemed to have been the kind of thing where if you were more part of the Mediterranean culture and you were playing in bigger spaces and probably outdoors, you played with nails. Interesting. And in France and England, it's more of an indoor culture. So that's why they played without the... Well, they played with that's flesh. That's fascinating. You know? Because I'm looking at your right hand and you do have nails, which is oh, yeah. definitely a bit more unique for an early music yeah. uh, player, but... It just gives you so much more flexibility. It means you can produce I mean, a... And it doesn't mean you can't play with just the flesh. Yeah. That, and you, that's the one thing most people don't understand. What you cannot do is play it the same way. You articulate very differently. You, um, I'll get a little bit wonkish here. Um, when you're grabbing double courses, you have to land on top of the two courses so both of them sound. And you have to allow the tip joint of your finger to collapse somewhat. So mm -hmm. you get a lot of contact with the flesh. Yeah. And the nail is just sort of a byproduct. If you want more, you just modify how much the tip joint flexes. Huh. Um, the other thing is playing thumb under. That was, yes, it was a technique. We know it was a technique, but it wasn't the only technique. And in fact, by around 1600, it, it, John Dowland is, says, you know, you play with the thumb in front of the fingers. Wow. If, you, if you read uh, Necessary Observations to Lute Playing from the Robert Dowland book, it's, they say it very directly. Um, and some of the greatest players I know, like uh, Nigel North plays thumb forward, my buddy, brilliant virtuoso John Schneiderman, the same thing, Steve Stubbs. Um, so the, the, thankfully, you know, one of the things I often say when I give a class is dogma is the antithesis of art. And if you start subscribing to an orthodoxy, you're going to find yourself in one narrow little world where you are playing with the absolute right technique and the only instrument that was played in that little village or that city for 10 years or 15 years. I'm sorry, we're 21st century musicians. We have to adapt. I drive to the gig. I'm, I'm happy I got a polio shot as a kid. <laughs> you know? Yeah, if we were to go re real authentic, uh, yeah, yeah, we'd uh, be we would showing be up on our carriages. And, no, we'd or, be dead now. Yeah, we would. <laughs> That's clear. No, it's... Uh, it's very, uh, it's very interesting hearing that, and uh, it is so important to adapt. Um, you know, I got to ask one more question um, in regards to kind of finicky or kind of more technical things. Are you sure. playing gut strings? I do, and I have them actually on on uh, my theorbo, and I have them on one of my Renaissance lute. But one of the issues is wound strings did come in to being in the 17th century, mm -hmm. and I can give you a number of citations where they talk about wound strings. Um, and I can show you iconographic evidence of it. Um, but you know, if you're touring, if you're playing and you, you know, you're changing climates, it's, it's like, it can be a nightmare. Yeah. And that's just 
one of the things you have to just accept. What I think is a much greater difference is when you play an instrument with different wood. If you play an instrument with a, a U wood back, which is a softer wood, versus one that's made of rosewood or maple, which is very hard, mm -hmm. the thickness of the top, how it's braced, how it's braced, the size of the belly on the instrument, the, the soundboard, that creates a much, much more dramatic change of sound than does, I believe, the strings between what we have now in terms of Nile gut, which is yeah. a synthetic reproduction of gut, or even carbon fiber or nylon. Um, but, you know, it's the, it's the instrument. I've done these things where I've played on gut strung instruments and synthetic strung instruments with some violinist friends of mine. I said, which one is which? Mm -hmm. And they screw it up constantly. They, it's, uh, I guess it is kind of a, a smaller uh, a aspect to it all when right. you look at the grand scene of things. And of course, the most important part is the player. Right. And how, what kind of sound do you make? Yeah. Well, and honestly, the best players out there can still make an awful instrument sound decent. Oh, without you question. Know? I, I, I'm a true believer of that. Um, I just want to finish one little thing, though, because um, I, I got a little sidetracked. So once I started playing lute, I then discovered the early guitar thing. And I was very lucky to have purchased a beautiful Miracore guitar, circa 1825, 1830. Um, and I used it on so many of my recordings, the Boccherini Quintets, the Merritt's recording, Giuliani Paganini, the Giuliani Concerto, Boccherini um, Symphony with Guitar. Um, and that just turned me on to the idea of early guitars. And there was only there were only one or two other players doing it at the time. Leif Christensen, who's tragically passed away, and Pavel Stadel who was starting to do it. And I remember him writing to me after I put out my Merz record about that. And hmm. um, it was, you know, just something that grabbed me, and I loved his yeah. sound. And, and that led me to Baroque guitars, of which are many different kinds. And um, on on the Giuliani, if I'm correct, you're the only person to have a, a full recording, one take, original instrumentation. Or, I wouldn't say it was or, one take. Or, I wish, okay. I wish it was. You wish it was. <laughs> and the, record, it would, the distinction about the recording is that it's um, the only one available that it's on a period instrument, but I think it's the only one available with the original orchestration on period instruments and no cuts. Yeah. It's the complete concerto as was published and as he performed it on April 3rd, 1808. Which April third happens to be my birthday. Which, really? Oh yeah. Oh, as it's and a Mar sign. And Mar and, yeah, it was and Marlon Brando and Alec Baldwin. So I'm in good company. Alec uh, Baldwin. April third and and, Ju and uh, the Giuliani premiere. Yes. Wow. <laughs> I, I've got Michael Jackson for my birthday. Uh, I don't know how I feel about that one. I, well, Michael's brilliant. I, I mean, he was brilliant. Yeah, he but, was a lost hole. It was but, sad. Yeah, he but he was a brilliant soul. musician. Yeah. But in a monstrum, I'm using um, for all you tech nerds out there. I usually talk into Shure SM7B, and believe it or not, this is a relatively cheap dynamic microphone. It's only about 400 bucks. This was the mic, not this one, that one would be worth thousands, but he recorded Thriller on this. He did? He recorded Thriller. And, <laughs> you know, the the um, the producer in the studio just went to the mic locker, and they said, oh, grab a mic for, for Michael. You, you know his voice best. And he grabbed this, and everyone was laughing at him. Like, why would you pick a cheap Shure microphone? And it worked fantastically for his voice, and now it's kind of known as, like, one of the better kind of microphones for voiceover and certain vocals, you know, That's it's, fantastic. it's crazy how it that. goes sometimes, you know, <laughs> you know, the story about Eddie Van Halen and uh, beat it, right? No, never... tell me please. Is that Eddie Van Halen? Um, Michael offered him either a percentage or a flat fee. I think like five grand and Eddie Van Halen said, right, Michael, Michael Jackson, he's kind of washed up. He's not, you know, he's, this isn't going to be any big deal. I'll take the five grand or oh, whatever man. it was. <laughs> <laughs> and this was before his career took off. Yeah, well, because oh, yeah. Thriller, wow. Thriller really pushed it and beat it was on Thriller, you know? Oh, my. He, he is probably kicking himself <laughs> still a, to this day. And it's a great guitar solo. <laughs> oh, and he took 5000 for that. I, I think that's what it is. I, I, may, I could be making hey, that Yeah, I up. mean, uh, that might have been before Van Halen really took off. And look, uh, as a musician, I can tell you from my experience, sometimes you get really desperate, you know? You start eating a lot of those ramen packages late at night, you hey, know? Hey, you know... <laughs> Hey, you know, a, a five grand, one, you know, one session. Sure, I'll take that. <laughs> That's 10,000 ramen packets right there. That's oh, enough food for a year. Very le no, I think it's a lot more than 10,000. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it depends if you're going premium ramen or not. Okay. But no. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> or if you're cracking some eggs or mushrooms into there. But um, 
you know, Van Halen, I mean, they, they have very humble roots. All these, you know, regardless of styles of music, you know, classical, jazz, rock, these legends, usually they have very humble roots. One of my uh, uh, teachers in the recording arts uh, minor I've been taking, he used to see Van Halen at the same bar. It was just, I, I forgot what it was. It was just some dive bar in Pasadena once a week. He would pay 10 bucks to see them. <laughs> and this was when Eddie would go on with the skeleton guitar, and he truly was, like, putting it together right on stage. Right. So it's like, are we going to hear Eddie tonight, or is it just going to set on fire? Like, it, it was real, that whole... Sure. And uh, it, it's just crazy how everything comes together sometimes for these I mean, musicians. You know, I, it's, it's a blessing for a lot of us. I'm an atheist, but I still feel I'm blessed. Um, so try to figure that one out when you grow up italian catholic <laughs> and you know i'm all italian and i have two passports so i really am an italian catholic you're an um, espresso drinker then of course yeah what are you kidding me do you have a mocha pot as well uh no i don't i, I that, you know you i don't wa- know if you are italian then. No, I'm uh, <laughs> <laughs> i have a nice delonghi that i've had for years okay okay I'll and i don't you know i can't compete with scott i'm sorry scott is like the king of espresso makers but you know what's interesting? He's uh, using an AeroPress now. I have an AeroPress, yeah. too. Now you travel. He's only using an AeroPress? He's almost exclusively Scott, using an AeroPress. Scott, this is a shout-out. We need to talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, it makes a good cup, but it, it's a, it's just a different uh, style of brew. And, yeah. You know, I love espresso, yeah. but it you have to invest a boatload of money to get good espresso which is why i've just not jumped into that but i i've been to the i've been to the third wave hipster pour over coffee with a which Chemex. is fine it's, it's all, just a different drink it's a different it's drink. A dr- different drink i love espresso a little too much stomach acid for yeah me. a little too I, much acid i just don't have the money to spend three thousand on a grinder when, when, we're, when we're off <laughs> mic i'll tell you a bargain okay 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 <laughs> Maybe because uh, that's a little too commercial for me yeah. to be. You know, it, you'll think I'm getting a kickback, and you know, if you came, if you grew up where I grew up, you would be getting a kickback. Oh yeah, <laughs> this just espresso. Yes. yes. <laughs> so from that, I started doing the burrow guitar stuff, and Mertz was an epiphany for me. And I have to thank David Leisner. He turned me on to Mertz. He was oh, the okay. first. He was the first one to really do it. Um, I was. I think I was the first to do it on a period guitar. I did Barden Klanger for Harmonia Monday. Um, it's just gorgeous stuff. And then I got into doing a lot of the Latin American and Spanish Baroque guitar music. This hmm. Santiago de Murcia. My, it's very funny. You know, this it's like you know the invention of the telephone with Meucci versus Alexander Graham Bell. You know, um, these kinds of things sort of are gestational and they come to be born at the same time. Like Paul Odette's recording of Murcia came out like a month after mine. And they were the first real, you know, hmm. highly recognized recordings of Santiago de Murcia's music. Um, and then I started, I decided I would put together a group to record and perform chamber music with the guitar um, from a variety of ep- epochs, but really focusing on that romance language culture of Italy, Spain, and Latin America. I know I'm, dry, I'm not leaving out France there, and I love French music, but it's a different aesthetic because Italy and Spain are so closely united linguistically, and Spain ruled southern Italy for, for quite a yeah. long period of time. Uh, in fact, my last name is a Spanish name. It was probably spelled with a B. In my father's family's village, um, Tejano, has a big Spanish palace in the middle of it. That was the um, sort of summer retreat for the Spanish viceroys. Hmm. From Naples, oh, and, my, wow. and my mother's family's from Basilicata, which is further south. It's the Alabama of Italy, <laughs> literally. <laughs> you know, did, you, did you guys did you, listen to Leonard Skinner or something over there? <laughs> yeah, the Italian version of it, yeah. <laughs> what, what's the Italian version of Leonard Skinner? I oh, hear I'm going to have to really think about that one. Actually, <laughs> That's a very seen. deep question. Yes. We, we've dug ourselves into a wormhole. <laughs> That's great. I love it. <laughs> so, any other recordings you'd like to talk about? Well, some of the, the recent ones, uh, I mentioned pass, um, in passing the What Artemisia Heard, which I, I just think it's magnificent. If your listeners don't know about the life of Artemisia Gentileschi, they need to. She was a musician who lived at the same time as Caravaggio. She's a little younger, um, but she was, she was a musician and a painter. She, was a, one of the mo- she is the most magnificent woman painter of the early 17th century, and her life was an incredible life. I won't go into it. 
read the book by Alexandra Lapierre. Okay. Um, my recording of Ludovico Roncalli, which I was really happy to do. Roncalli's book of guitar music, people knew a couple of pieces from it, but they didn't know the whole suites. Um, those are both on Sono Luminous. Um, that, that one was sponsored by Cardinal Benedetto Pamphili, who was a real bigwig in Italy. Um, he wrote libretti for Handel and Scarlatti. Um, my group, El Mundo, had a nice Grammy nomination a few a couple of years ago with um, the Kingdoms of Castile, which surveys Spanish music from all the different Spanish vice royalties um, in Latin America, south of Italy, Spain. Um, I got about 35 of them out of commercially, so it's a little too long a list, but I think 30, I plugged myself pretty well. 35, <laughs> 35 records, though. I, I can't imagine the work that's gone into that. I, I, I'm scared for when I make my first record. It, it's just... Uh, but, you know, I, I feel early musicians in particular are just so much more flexible and just willing to go for it and just play concerts. A lot of times, strict, just orthodox classical guitarists, we get really kind of caught up and like, oh, I got to make sure it's perfect. But remember, the, the big difference is, well, I do have a number of solo recordings. It's different when you have an ensemble. Yeah. You know, I love playing in a band. You know, I have maybe six or seven solo, solo recordings, but I love playing in a band. Yeah. And, and interestingly... Um, half of my output, or maybe a third of it, is on is like 19th century music or even contemporary music with my flute player friend Laurel Zucker. Um, that's the weirdest part of my life is huh. that I still have like a serious foot in the regular guitar world. Yeah, <laughs> even though you're so involved with, as I said, a, a, a man of true renaissance. Uh, I, lo I, I, just, I love it. I love the music. It's great. And that's what it's all about. You we know, need to love what we do. Yeah. No, I'm, as I said before, I'm an atheist who's blessed figure that one I, out I, i've never heard that one before but now i want to say that phrase but now but then i'd be stealing your phrase yeah no you can't steal I, my shit. I, I i'll say as Remember, savino would cousins. say I, yeah, I, so, oh, that, yeah, i'm oh, from yeah, brooklyn yeah, long yeah, island yeah, southern oh, italy so you got Just, some mafia you know, people are going to be banging on my door hey, before i know I think it. we're going to have to have a talk after this especially about that uh, mocha oh. pot <laughs> thanks so much for having me thank you for being with us my pleasure thanks again richard for being on the show Please join me in two weeks for a conversation with Elliot Fisk. I'll wrap things up today with the opening track from El Mundo's Grammy-nominated record, The Kingdoms of Castile. This is a really fun piece by the famous Scarlatti, Symphonia par en Pesar. Uh, I thought it was really fun to hear a piece by Scarlatti. That wasn't one of the sonatas we always hear on the guitar. I'm David Steinhardt, and we'll see you next time for the Tone Bass Classical Guitar Podcast. Thank you.